One of the most mysterious chapters in all of scripture is Revelation chapter 20. It's one that has been argued about throughout church history by different commentators who believe that it's talking about this time where Jesus is ruling and reigning, often referred to as the millennium. And the millennium is really the centerpiece of argument when it comes to eschatology. People are asking, um, is the millennium a pre-millennial reign of Christ, meaning that Christ returns and then establishes the reign? Um, is it an amillennial reign of Christ, meaning that it's not present on earth at all, but it's rather in heaven? Or is it a post-millennial reign, meaning that it happens after or it happens before Christ returns? This is something that's been debated, but perhaps one of the key Parts of this whole debate revolves around something called the first resurrection. Now in Revelation chapter 20, we read about something called the first resurrection. And our premillennial brothers and sisters will argue that this is a resurrection that happens at the beginning of the thousand year period after the second coming of Christ, a bodily resurrection of all the saints from the Old Testament age and from the tribulation period that had just happened prior, being raised to reign with Christ. And that after this thousand years, the rest of the dead are bodily raised for judgment. Now the amillennial would say that this first resurrection is a spiritual resurrection of believers at death being resurrected into the heavenly places. And that the second resurrection, or the resurrection that happens at the end of the thousand years, is the general resurrection of both the good and the wicked to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, as a post-millennial, or an optimistic amillennial, some might say, I have a nuanced perspective. Because in Revelation 20, the word for resurrection that is used is the Greek word anastasis. And this word is really only seen in all of scripture to refer to a bodily resurrection. And so this is the difficulty of the amillennial position or the postmillennial position. Because they typically would argue that this resurrection is spiritual, it does not seem to fit with the language that's used to describe this resurrection. And the premillennial will point this out emphatically. They will say, this word, anastasis, must be a physical resurrection. Therefore, after Christ returns, there are two resurrections, one at the beginning of the thousand years and one at the end. And our dispensationalist friends would say that there's one at the rapture, one again at the beginning of the thousand years, and one again at the end. They would even split it up into three different resurrections. Now, I see validity to the argument that this must be seen as a physical resurrection. But how do we reconcile this idea with the creeds that seem to indicate a general resurrection and with the rest of scripture, which is clear that at the time of the resurrection, it will be both a resurrection of the good and the wicked. So in reconciling this, we must look at the text itself. It talks about in verse 4 that there are thrones, and seated on them were those to whom authority to judge was committed. <clears throat> it says, I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Now this is a difficult text, but one of the clues we have is in the beginning of verse 4, where it says, Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Now in the entire book of Revelation, the word thrones is used exclusively to refer to thrones in heaven, not thrones on earth. And so contrary to the premillennial understanding, this most naturally refers to thrones in heaven. And it's further validified when we see, or further validated, I don't think, I think I just made up a word there. It's further validated when we look at Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, with the exaltation of Christ, where we see Christ the Son of Man coming before the Ancient of Days, 
we also see thrones. And we see these thrones are being set for a time of judgment. Books are opened. And so we see this idea that these thrones are in heaven. Or even at the beginning of Revelation, when John is swept up by the Spirit into the heavenlies, he sees thrones. He sees a throne room, the throne room of God. And so the most natural reading would assume that these thrones are not on earth in a political reinstated nation of Israel, but rather these thrones are in heaven. So with that established, it still doesn't answer the question, how is the first resurrection physical? Well, I think it becomes very plain when you look at the word resurrection and you look at the word first. Now we know that someday there is going to be a resurrection of our bodies where we will rise from the grave either to the resurrection of life or to the resurrection of judgment. But there was already a resurrection that took place in the middle of history that pointed ahead to this eschatological reality. There was already a resurrection that promised by looking to that that we ourselves will be resurrected. And that resurrection is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the first resurrection. Jesus Christ was the first to rise from the grave, never to perish again. Jesus Christ is in whom we as Christians are made alive. So you see, this physical necessity can be answered by pointing to the physical reality of Jesus Christ's resurrection without diminishing the validity of the amillennial interpretation, which states that we are raised and seated in heaven on these thrones. We are raised and seated in the heavenly places to reign with Christ, and that this is a spiritual reality. When we as Christians are regenerated, when we're made alive together with Christ, in Ephesians, Paul says we're made alive together with Christ and seated in the heavenly places, not with Christ Jesus, but in Christ Jesus. So you see, we're not just raised to seat to be seated in heaven with Christ, but actually in Christ. Why? Well, it's because in Christ we are raised. In Christ we are made alive. In the eschatological reality of Christ's resurrection is our resurrection. If Christ didn't rise, neither shall we. If Christ is not in heaven, neither are we. If Christ has not been the perfect sacrifice, then our sins are not atoned for and we are still dead. So you see, Paul's insistence that this is not just a with Christ, but it's an in Christ, is crucial to understanding that the first resurrection is Christ's resurrection. And the reason we can know this for certain is because of the language that follows. Blessed and holy is the one who what? Who shares in the first resurrection. So you see, this isn't our resurrection. This is something we are partaking in. It's something that we are sharing in. It's something that is outside of us, that belongs to another, that is being gifted to us as something we're sharing in. The resurrection at the end of history, by God's grace, is our resurrection. But the first resurrection is not our resurrection. It's a sharing in Christ's resurrection, which is the eschatological sign or symbol that points ahead to the eschatological consummation. So it's the inauguration of the consummation. And in Christ, we are made alive. We are righteous. We are standing before God. We are holy. We are blameless before God. And that points ahead to the declaration that will be made on Judgment Day when Christ returns. And so you see, the first resurrection is both a spiritual and physical reality. The first resurrection is Christ's, but we are made partakers of it by the grace of God, making us alive and seating us together with Christ in the heavenly places where we await the eschatological consummation when he descends with a shout, the dead in Christ rise, and those who are alive rise up to meet the Lord in the air, and thus heaven and earth will be joined, heaven and earth will be unified And we will be one with Christ in a consummated new heavens and new earth.